Don't round of applause for Rio who is sponsoring Beer Pizza, the venue, who also grinds the monoliths and all of those things. Now. So, uh, colleagues just told me uh, we are especially fond of our front end monoliths. So, if anybody wants to grind the front end monoliths, we are expecting you very soon. Uh, Besides that, uh, thank you very much to CodeCentric and to David. Normally, I pick the speakers by looking at conference talks and such, but David uh, was kind enough to say, hey, we have Michael for an internal workshop, or we, we pull in uh, Michael, and he wants to do a meetup. Why don't we want to present it at the microservice meetup? So this happened the first time that somebody is bringing me a speaker, and then one of the more prominent speakers, so I'm glad that today we have Michael Nygaard featuring CodeCentric at the Tag Online. Um, Michael will introduce himself because he can do that better than myself, and he will grind the monolith. So have uh, fun with the talk, and I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much for being here. Well, it's my very great pleasure to be here. I, I get to talk to you tonight, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, so about me, I'm primarily a developer. Uh, I've also been a software architect for some time. Uh, that began when I joined a new consulting company, and they walked me into the client's location and introduced me as the new software architect. I said, oh, I should probably find out what that means. <laughs> so I've spent uh, quite a long time trying to understand what that means, being a software architect. I've lived through the dark years when the A word was not to be spoken. Um, and, and I think we've come through it. And, and so people are uh, rehabilitating the term. Uh, we've gotten away from that ivory tower perception a bit. Um, I've also had the good fortune to uh, take a, a journey into operations. And the first thing I learned about operations was that I knew nothing about what operations really was. I thought operations was about uh, replacing CPUs and disk drives when they failed. Uh, but it turned out almost all of the work we did in operations was about bad software failing in production. Um, so I was one of the only developers in operations. I was able to debug things that other people uh, would just reboot. And so uh, I learned that you know sometimes I could point to an individual line of code and say, this, this code here is why your software failed. And the developers would say, we didn't give you the code. And I go, I know, but I have decompilers, and I can find this out. So I learned a lot about what made software work and what made it fail in production. And I tried to bring that knowledge back into the development community with this book called Release It, uh, published in 2007. Just a few things have changed since 2007. Uh, I had a sentence in there that said something like, uh, in the future, virtualization might be a way to solve this problem if it becomes mainstream. Well, I think we can safely say it became mainstream uh, about a year after I published the book. So there's a new update to release it. Uh, second edition, out now, uh, updated for the cloud and microservices era. Today what I want to talk to you about uh, is really sort of an experience report from several uh, call them digital transformation projects, because that's what the sponsors call them. I've never liked that term, it's a little vague, nebulous, you know, digital. I've got 10 digits, you know, we've been using digits for a long time. And transformation implies from something to something as if you're going to be done at a particular point in time. But the reality of these projects is we're not aiming to be done. We're aiming to transition to a state where we can continue moving and changing. So I want to talk about what it means to have one of these monoliths and to break it down. And the very first thing I want to ask is, what's so bad about a monolith? There's a lot to like in a monolith. I can see all the code. I can refactor all the code. I can test all the code. I may not see all the data, and sometimes the code behaves differently depending on the data. There may be too much code for one human to comprehend, but I suppose if I run my debugger long enough and trace and follow object to object to object, I can find out what's going on. So monoliths have some attractive qualities, but we run into these problems. 
And uh, when I pose these questions in my, my workshops and my talks, and I say, you know, what is it that makes you want to get away from a monolith? Why are you interested in microservices? Most people don't tell me that it's because they read a magazine article on an airline about microservices and said, I need to do that. Um, and that's because I'm teaching actual developers and not the CIOs who actually read the magazine articles and the Gartner reports and what have you. Um, what people tell me is that they want to move faster. They want individual teams to be able to deploy at their own pace. And I say, well, why can't you do that now? What stops you from taking your monolith and moving to a deploy on commit model? And the answer is, it would be uh, risky. Uh, in fact, we have no way to contain the risk. And when something bad happens, it happens everywhere at once. And this is where we do see some of the downsides of the monolith. It has bad safety properties. One developer can write a line of code that exhausts a thread pool, and you're down. And everybody's down, and all features are down simultaneously. I can't really check for that, uh, not very effectively. We don't have testing methods that help me find that condition. Um, and we don't have <coughs> frameworks and platforms and languages that help me isolate you know, one developer's thread pool code from another developer's thread pool code. And so we have poor safety properties. And when we, when we have poor safety properties, we naturally grow review processes. And this is why the monolith is slow. You could configure Git to deploy on push, but you need code review. You need change review. You need architecture review, and so on. And so when, when we talk about teams moving faster, what I really want us to think is it's about teams moving faster safely. So when we decompose things, we get to a situation where the amount of damage that one team's bad code can do is limited. It's limited at runtime because you're building in operational safety in the form of things like circuit breakers and bypasses and cache values. But it's also limited in the longer span of time. So one team's bad code ends at the process boundary. And if you need to, you can delete all that code and replace it with a new implementation and the rest of the world doesn't care. So it's sort of like you take the most radioactive code you've got and you put a Chernobyl dome over it and you pretend it's not there until it's time to replace it completely. <coughs> so over the years we've been sold many different uh, approaches to getting this kind of safety and isolation and productivity. Um, I remember Beans. Uh, we were supposed to have this marketplace of components. Uh, the beans didn't work out, so we wanted enterprise beans, because you know if it's enterprise, it costs a thousand times more. Um, that really didn't work out either. Um, and I think the reason that it didn't work out is because of something that um, uh, an Australian academic named James Noble calls the Lego hypothesis. Now, spoiler alert, uh, he talks about it in a paper called The Death of the Lego Hypothesis. So this is not going to end well. <laughs> the Lego hypothesis is the dream that someday we will have software components that we can plug together as easily as we connect electronic components. So this is the software IC idea, if you've been in the industry long enough to, to recall that term. Uh, an integrated circuit that we can just plug together and get big software working from small independent pieces. What Noble observed is that Lego have only three dimensions to work in. This may not be a novel observation. We all have three dimensions to work in, you know, up, down, left, right, forward, back. One Lego brick can only interact with its neighbors in those three dimensions. So the sort of span of influence of one brick is limited. I'll also point out that they have a very limited interface. There's a dot and there's a hole. That's it. Uh, so we do get great composability from LEGO. But when we look at how software connects, we see an interesting uh, sort of curve emerge. And it's one of these curves that makes people who study complex systems just shake their head. Because every time you see one of these curves, you know things are going to get weird. Uh, 
This is a power law, and we see it with things like the strength of earthquakes. There are many, many, many very weak earthquakes all the time. There are fewer and fewer big ones. But the interesting thing is, when you get to this tail of the really big earthquakes, they happen way more often than you would get with a Gaussian or a normal distribution. So with a Gaussian or a normal distribution like you know human height, the idea of finding someone that's five or six standard deviations away from average is pretty unlikely. You will probably never meet a human who's a hundred standard deviations away from average. Right? With earthquakes, you can easily find an earthquake that's a hundred uh, standard deviations. I mean, it doesn't really make sense to talk about the standard deviations, but use variance is kind of the same thing. Apologies to anyone who's a statistician. Uh, we can talk later. We'll get it straight out. <laughs> Power laws occur whenever you have a reinforcing loop. So we also find power laws in income. Um, and income has a natural reinforcing loop. When you have a lot of money, you can buy things that make you more money. And so people who are far out on this tail tend to go farther out on this tail. Software components exhibit a similar characteristic. Most pieces of software talking at the level of methods, classes, functions, modules, most of them have very few connections. Some have a lot of connections, and some really have a lot of connections. You know, thousands upon thousands. Uh, these often have names like util or manager. <laughs> if you try to map this into dimensions and say, how many dimensions do I have to be able to support tens of thousands of connections, you find that you end up with thousands of dimensions. Imagine Lego in thousands of dimensions. Each block can interact with thousands upon thousands of neighbors. I can't really picture it. I don't know if anyone can. But the odds that something as simple as dot and hole would work for composing these things go way down. And so we can't really think about limiting the scope of these connections. Um, what we have is a lot more like mycelium, you know, the, uh, the tendrils of uh, fungus that weave together through soil. And we, we found that these actually transmit signals. So you can have action at a distance connected by the threads of hyphae. Um, Kind of scary if anyone had mushrooms on their pizza, you know, that may be happening right now. <laughs> so we start off with an architecture diagram that looks a little like this. Uh, pretty standard looking uh, layer cake. Um, and we think that actually maybe we've got some, some verticals or some components within our layers. We, we can separate things into different subdomains, if you like. <coughs> You might even build it this way. But the moment will come when time is short, and we're going to make just one call across one of these boundaries from domain to domain. And how bad can it be? It's just one call. We'll refactor it later. <laughs> Maybe we've got a few of them that we're going to ask for a refactoring iteration. Oh, yeah. yeah, all right. Well, uh, anyone who wants a refactoring iteration, let's also talk later. <laughs> so we grow these hyphae, this mycelium through our code base, these horizontal connections that start to create a structure that people will call spaghetti, or hairball, or big ball of mud. And once a few of these have set in, people can no longer discern the structure and so they no longer even feel guilty about making one of these horizontal calls. It's just the way things are done. This is the architecture erosion that eliminates your safety and creates action at a distance. This is our 10,000 dimensional connections. And of course, we get them in the vertical direction as well. Um, and now we really start to think maybe we're due for a rewrite. After all, it's only two weeks. At the same time, we've got cross-cutting concerns that end up uh, intersecting all of these layers and showing up in every piece of our code. So you look at a particular method, 
and you have some logging in the method, you have some metrics being emitted, you have some authentication or at least authorization. We've tried a bunch of techniques to extract this from the individual methods. We've tried aspect-oriented programming, didn't work out so well. We've tried Java EE with you know, advice to the container to do this. Um, we're currently, a lot of us, trying Spring Boot with annotations to do this, but it still ends up getting into the code. And so we, we don't have separated concerns here, we don't have separated concerns here, and this is why we want to break down the monoliths. I want to take a brief excursion to talk about layers for a minute, since layers are sort of the most fundamental architecture pattern we apply. Um, and uh, I go back to uh, a great book called The Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture, Volume 1, where they discuss the layers pattern. And I think it's important to think of it as a pattern because that means it's a choice. It is not a fact of nature. It is not a natural way of building software. If there is a natural way of building software, it's the big ball of mud. So layers uh, were created to respond to forces in a context. So our context is pretty great. System that requires decomposition. Yeah, we're all there. Mix of high level and low level concerns, absolutely. Several operations at the same level of abstraction. Yeah, level zero. <laughs> Everything's at the bottom level, yeah, okay. Uh, but then the forces are especially interesting. Oops. Uh, the forces are especially interesting because we have statements like interfaces should be stable, maybe standardized. How many of you have standardized your persistence layer and the interfaces to it? This is really talking more about layers in a network stack than in a business application. Parts should be interchangeable. So I'm going to swap out my domain layer with your domain layer. Other systems may reuse lower layers. Absolutely not. Forget it. No, that does not apply. So a lot of the motivation for layers in the first place doesn't really hold. And I think that that, combined with our languages and frameworks, is why we create these layers where I have to write a foo domain object, a foo repository, a foo mapping, a foo view, and a controller. Foo controller, of course. <laughs> So we're not isolating things into layers. If we were doing layers the way this means, something which is a class in one layer should only appear as instances of objects in another layer. So if you have a domain class, it should appear as instances of table, instances of column or query, instances of view. But you should not have you know, a customer class in the domain, a customer view, a customer repository, and so on. OK, so we'll return from that interrupt and uh, go into more about why we need to break down these monoliths. And a lot of it has to do with those safety properties. And when we get a, safety, a breakdown in safety, we end up with review processes. And the more breakdowns in safety you get, the more review processes you get. Um, and I, I wrote about this in a blog post I called The Fear Cycle, where an organization that begins to fear its technology will try to change it as little as possible. So the changes they make tend to be kludges. And those kludges will have problems, and so they get more afraid of their technology and <laughs> slow down even further. Um, I have yet to see an organization emerge from this fear cycle. Well, in monoliths, we can get a lot of safety failures. There's no limit to the effects of bad code. So we can have operational problems, like memory leaks, thread pool exhaustion, connection pool exhaustion, deadlocks. Um, we can have a lot of shared code down in the lower layers of a system that people are afraid to change. So one of my clients had uh, built their own implementation of JPA. Um, and they built it off of a draft version of the 1.0 spec. Twelve years later, they're still running on their fork of the draft version of the 1.0 spec. But it's used by everything. 12 million lines of Java code using this same persistence layer. Who's going to be the one to jump in there and try and modify that persistence layer? Absolutely nobody wants to leap on that hand grenade. 
And then we also get this issue of semantic coupling. This is something that your IDE won't help you find, but it's an assumption that's baked into multiple parts of the code about how some pattern of interaction works or about constraints that some other part of the system applies. That semantic coupling is especially hard to find because uh, you know, when, when you relax the constraints in one part of your code, you may not have a unit test that catches that. And so now you've got data propagating through your system, which will cause a far distant failure later, after the data has been written to the database, pulled out a month later for some report, and then it blows up. And now you have to trace back, how did that get created? That kind of incident response provokes reviews, provokes the fear cycle. So we want to break our monoliths up. Uh, I have some uh, perhaps unwelcome news. Uh, it's going to be a very hard road. I'm describing my experiences. Other people's experiences may vary. Your mileage may vary. It may be that uh, I'm a glutton for punishment, and so I only go to particularly messed up companies. Uh, maybe that they seek me out. I don't know. Uh, so I'm not sure how representative this is going to be, but I'm going to describe to you my experiences and the fact that two out of three transformation projects like this fail. And by fail, I mean the company goes bankrupt, the project gets canceled without delivering value, and in some cases the entire company got liquidated. So I'm going to describe some strategies that didn't work, and I'll describe some that kind of worked, and I'll describe some that I'm pretty sure will work. And afterwards, we're going to have a quiz so you can figure out which is which. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding about that. We'll, we'll talk about the strategies. Uh, the first one I want to describe is perhaps the most obvious strategy towards breaking up a monolith, and I call it clean then separate. Uh, one uh, manager called this combing out the hairball which is just an awful image. I have cats. I don't want to comb out here, really. Uh, but the idea is we have the monolith. Before we start splitting it up into multiple processes talking across a network, let's try to isolate the domain. We'll create language level interfaces, Java interfaces, C sharp interfaces. Um, and then we're going to turn those interfaces into real network interfaces. Seems very logical. Right? Quite straightforward. The problem is that it takes too long. You end up telling your executives that we're going to have a reduced rate of feature delivery for the next two or three years. And you may get one of them scoffing at you like, reduced? From what? Zero to zero? <laughs> executives get impatient. Sales executives get really impatient. Um, and so, sometimes this just defeats the whole project. One of the companies that was sold out from under us was on this path. It was actually technically succeeding on this path, but the organization failed in the meantime. The other thing that can happen is, uh, if you don't halt feature delivery, then people will continue delivering features in the <coughs> monolith while you're also trying to break up the monolith and a few uh, dynamics come into play here. One, the people who are left behind tending the monolith get upset that they're not on the cool microservices work. They know that they are in a career dead-ending pathway. They are the maintenance programmers. They might as well be doing COBOL. <laughs> yeah, ooh, right. Um, so they're not the most motivated. Right, to begin with. But second, suppose you are on this maintenance crew building these features, and you are motivated, and you want to do good work. You approach a piece of code that's gnarly and tangled together, and you decide, I'm going to refactor this to make it easy to add the feature, and then I'm going to refactor it to make the feature natural. You're putting in hard work knowing that that is not the design that microservices people are using, and it's going to be thrown away. 
So you're more likely to just prang in whatever you can prang in. And so the architectural erosion that has already been a problem accelerates on the ongoing feature work while other people <coughs> are trying to clean it up. It's as if one team is going around installing new windows and another team is coming along with bats afterwards. <laughs> so this approach doesn't work. Another approach that is very common, very tempting, uh, is you take all the nouns in your arena, your domain, and you make them into CRUD services. We call them entity services to make them sound a little better than CRUD. But essentially, you've got a database and you're putting a REST interface on it. Spring Boot makes this super easy. You just declare an interface for a repository and it puts it straight onto your routes, right? With exactly put, post, get, and delete. It's CRUD. The problem with entity services, um, Actually, there are many problems, and I've written an extended series of blog posts about it. Ongoing, because I'm not going to stop ranting on this topic. Um, one of the problems is, if these really are key entities in your domain, then most of your business processes are going to involve these key entities. So you're going to have a huge fan-in of dependencies onto these entity services. It means high traffic, and it means if you try to deploy them or change them or update them, it's really disruptive to all the business processes. Any failure in one of those entity services means you're losing functionality across your enterprise all at once. So, uh, I don't like those. Um, I have some suggestions later on for things to do other than entity services, but I will say this. If you have services with big names like customer, order, policy, loan, you know, any of those big, unified sounding nouns, be very skeptical of them. Ask what behavior they provide, what intelligence do they add. If all the intelligence, if all the brains lives in a higher level, you have a big problem. So another approach I've seen is the project team approach. This is where, um, you know, typically in a, in a corporate environment with internal development, <coughs> You want to keep your developer utilization high because developers are expensive. So you pull developers out of a pool, you assign them to a project with a project manager, and when they're done, they go back into the pool so they can work on something else. This also goes under the term matrix management in many places. Um, there are some problems here. Uh, one is that uh, people on projects get measured on the completion of the project, not the long-term health of the system they deliver. And so I have no kidding seen a project manager make a delivery date by having the development team delete 3,500 test cases. <laughs> Just delete them. Um, because it was going to take too long to make them all pass. Now maybe they were bad tests, that's certainly possible, but I think maybe something else was going on there too. The other issue is developers who kind of get plucked out and thrown on a project are sort of told to care about this project and about this chunk of code for a while. But then when we're done, you have to stop caring about it. You, you don't get to care about what happens to it after you're back in the pool and on to the next project. <laughs> I don't like that. I think if you're going to do the hard work, it's better if you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. You get to live with the nice code base. All too many times, the developers who are able to clean up a big mess get rewarded by being assigned a bigger mess. <laughs> so, I like moving to product teams. Uh, one of the successful transitions was all about taking a big, monolithic, walled garden system and converting it into a loose formation of product teams flying in approximately the same direction. Each product team had uh, people responsible for the business. They had P&L responsibility. They had analysts. They had machine learning people. They had marketers. They had developers, admins, operations. So they could conceive of a change, figure out how they would know if it was working, roll out the change, and get rid of it, all within the boundaries of the team. This is a very successful approach, but a hard transition if your organization is all about cost-based and utilization-based accounting. 
Another failed strategy is what I call the clean sheet design or the greenfield design. This is the one that says, uh, yeah, we've got this legacy monolith, but uh, instead of trying to change it, we're just going to build something new because now we're much smarter and we know how to do it right this time. Very attractive. I mean, uh, everybody would rather start with an empty editor in a brand new directory than 12 million lines of ancient Java, right? Uh, the problem is that we, we're not actually that much smarter. We make the same mistakes over and over again. We are overconfident. Um, we uh, aim too high. We, we, we develop hubris. There's this thing called the second system effect that uh, Fred Brooks identified in the Mythical Man Month uh, like 30 years ago now, 35 years, something like that. The second system effect occurs uh, when you're setting out the requirements for version 2 or mark 2 and you add to the requirements everything you didn't get the first time around because this time we're going to do it right and so the second system balloons out of control the scope gets too large and it never delivers the third system is the one that succeeds <laughs> so um, oh the other thing is we don't take account of past experience uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and in it he relates being on a committee that was aimed at redesigning the curriculum for some college course or pro program. And they went around the room estimating how long it would take to do this uh, rebuild. The estimate came up about six months. Kahneman had a thought. He said, wait a minute, didn't you just finish a curriculum redesign? Yeah. How long did that take? Two years. <laughs> okay. And, and, and you did one a little while ago. How long did that take? Well, three years. Five if you count the pre-work. <laughs> What's pre-work? Well, it's the work you do before the work. <laughs> so five years. Yeah, all right, five years. So they went around again. And all those people who had just estimated six months had never been able to do it in less than two years, and had never seen it done in less than two years. So what do you think their next estimate was? Would you estimate two years in that situation? I would go higher. <laughs> so the message I continually deliver is designed in context of what you have. Make incremental changes. Yes, it's going to be hard, but that's all right. Hard work pays off. When you design in context, you will not come up with the design you would have from a clean sheet of paper. But that's OK, too. A system can show its history. Photographers like to take pictures of people whose faces tell a story. They don't like taking pictures of babies. I mean, that's where the money is. But they'd rather take a picture of someone with deep lines carved in. Crow's feet. You can tell if the feet go down, it's been a hard life. If the feet go up, they've had laughter. This is the picture they want to take. That's what our systems can be. Our systems can have character and scars. So a partial success is the strangler pattern. Uh, the strangler was named by Martin Fowler. Um, important to say that sentence clearly. The Strangler was named by Martin Fowler, not the Strangler was. But the Strangler was named by Martin Fowler. And the idea is that you begin to intercept traffic to the old system and divert it off to a new implementation. And sometimes this is going to get a little messy. So you'll divert the traffic, and it still has to call back to the monolith for some parts. Or maybe it crisscrosses a bit. You may have a transitionary phase where you're sharing a database. And people will say, doesn't that break the rules of microservices? Every service should have its own data. Yes, it should, and it will, in time. So the strangler pattern is about enabling that migration feature by feature. And once again, the features that you pull out are going to be the ones that you can pull out, not necessarily the ones that you would most like to pull out, or even the most critical ones. Actually. Tackling the most critical problems first is kind of an anti-pattern of its own. Sort of like saying, we've got this mission-critical project, must succeed, we're betting the company on it. Let's try a new language, new methodology, and new deployment platform. 
<laughs> so the strangler pattern sometimes works, if you can get there fast enough. Um, sometimes it means you are uh, duplicating traffic and just not using the results of one side or the other. Uh, sometimes it means things get worse for a little while before they get better. But it can work. The services you get out of this are, again, not going to be the ones you would have designed from scratch. But that's okay, because the whole point is now you can change things more easily and more readily. So the services that you pull out don't have to live forever. They can be eliminated a few months after they were created. A surprisingly fun approach that can succeed is this clone and slash approach. So we start with the current monolith, which we know it works, or at least mostly works most of the time. We start with that, and we give copies of it to multiple teams, and we tell each of these teams, you only have to keep your functionality working, and the rest of the code, do whatever you want. So I have this with uh, an online, like, uh, uh, e-commerce as a service company. They had a big, what is flashing? It's not my screen, right? Oh. Something out there, all right. Uh, they had a big uh, monolith that was doing content management and like store setup and vendor setup on one side, and on the other side it was doing uh, storefront presentation, order and post order processes. Because it did both of these things in the same code base and pretty much the same schema, uh, there was code in the storefront side that was like, get item, get versions, get most recent published version. I mean, it wasn't that bad, but it was close to that bad. Uh, and only after chaining through those calls could you actually get the item details to display. Well, that was there because the same item class was handling content setup, publishing, lifecycle processes, as well as storefront. The storefront is never going to call a setter on an item object. It better not call a setter on an item object. It doesn't care about versions. So we, we copied the code, we cloned it, and told the, the uh, uh, content management and vendor setup people, do whatever you want. Your stuff has to keep running. Your stuff has to keep running. <clears throat> One of the teams had a deletion party. <laughs> they sat there drinking beer, deleting code, drinking more beer, deleting code. I'm not sure what all they ended up deleting. But within a couple of months, they were delivering four times as often as they had been before. This also helps with those common mode dependencies. So remember that JPA implementation? Nobody was willing to touch it when it might break everything. And you know, if you're in content management and you break the storefront, your career is toast. You're done. So they're not gonna do it, they're not gonna touch it. But if you're working on content management and you know that you can break it and fix it before anyone else gets in trouble, or before you get in trouble for messing with anyone else, um, then you're much more willing to dive in and make changes. And that's exactly what happened. So I call this one a, a partial success. Um, the product teams got along pretty well. They, they were doing what they needed. There were some things that you know, weren't great about it. These were not microservices. These were like mega services. Um, but they were the basis for continuing decomposition. I don't know how this experiment would have played out, because this was also at the company that got sold partway through this whole transition and they were sold to private equity who was really just interested in cutting up the company for assets. So I can't be sure. But I think this was going down the right path. Um, the next success pattern is continual redesign and rebuild. You're never gonna be done with this. Um, it, you, know, you start off pulling out services that are way too big, you keep decomposing them, you will factor them horizontally when you find features that uh, are actually needed by different consumer groups that are at kind of the same level of abstraction. You'll also factor them vertically when you realize, you know, I've got this kind of specific, or use case specific service, but there's something much more general lurking underneath it. And I want to factor that out so it can be used in multiple places. This is an ongoing process. 
It's an evolutionary process. So services that win, <clears throat> that win customers will thrive and continue and grow and get more done. Services that don't attract customers go extinct. And they should go extinct. This is the reverse of how most enterprises fund their software. Most enterprises will take the stuff that's succeeding and starve it of money and resources because it's working, and they pour money into the projects that are over budget, under delivering, and have too many people on them. Let's turn that around. Now, there's a couple of issues here. Um, you know, it doesn't always feel good to delete your own code. Like, deletion parties are a lot better when it's somebody else's code you're getting rid of. Um, uh, and deleting code that they just put out there seems wrong somehow. A lot of companies still think of code as a capital asset, as though they bought a new factory machine. And uh, at least in the US, if you delete that code before the three year depreciation period is done, you're supposed to take a write off for the lines of code you deleted. But we know that sometimes the most productive day you've got is when you've deleted hundreds of lines of code that doesn't need to be there. You have improved the business by deleting it. So I think of code as inventory. But even so, there's code that I really like, and I hate to delete it. But it can be the right thing to do. Another success pattern uh, that I want to talk about is services by life cycle. So if you're not doing entity services, how do you figure out where to break things up? Because we have a lot of processes that all seem to touch the same data and the same attributes. I, I found this that um, very often when you have these long-lived domain objects, they go through a distinct life cycle where there are phases. And at different phases, different attributes are writable. So I, I observed this at a peer-to-peer -peer lending company that had a uh, monolithic MVP. <coughs> it wasn't that big a monolith, but you know they wanted to break it up. And they had a loan object. And the loan object got initiated the first time somebody said, I want to ask for some money. And the same loan object got updated over and over again as they were building their project, putting in text and photos of their dog and their uh, tiki hut and whatever else they were trying to do. Um, and then it moved into a phase where uh, they were negotiating the interest rate that was going to be charged on this loan. And at that point, you can't change the amount you're asking for. After you agree on the interest rate, it goes out and gets shown to investors. Well, you can't change the project after you're showing it to investors. Once the investors put money in, it becomes a loan. Like, money moves around in accounts, there are legal documents written. You really can't change all the earlier stuff. So there's this life cycle. And when we looked at the database table, it was like 100 columns wide. And at first, these columns were read-write, everything else was null. And then, based on a state flag, these columns became uh, read-only, these were read-write, and the rest of them were null. If you have any kind of pattern like that, look for a way to make a service for each phase of the life cycle and exchange documents among them to say when you're moving into the next phase. So I, I found this one uh, popping up much more often in uh, business processes than I would have thought. All right, I've given you several slides of good news, so I've got to go back to a failed one. Um, definitely a failed pattern is domain objects on the wire. What I mean by on the wire is taking a domain object and putting it through a mapping framework where you can directly generate JSON from your uh, domain object or directly generate XML from your domain object. It worked great for version one, and only version one. The problem is that um, it allows too much control on the part of other uh, services. You're allowing too much coupling to the implementation details of your domain objects. The uh, resources that you're exchanging, the representations you exchange on the wire, are protocol artifacts, not domain artifacts. So even if you start off with a class that's out there as part of your API, it should remain part of your API and you translate it to your domain. Um, this way, uh, in future versions, you can um, uh, add new versions of the class out there and map them all into the current domain. So I work in a language and a framework where I just get data, so I don't even have to do mapping into classes. I just get 
maps, lists, vectors, and so on. So I can treat data as data. But if you need to map to uh, objects, represent the interface, the API in your object, not the domain. Um, and that kind of uh, leads toward uh, refactoring to hexagons uh, in terms of the hexagonal architecture. I really like the hexagonal architecture because it lets me uh, isolate the domain, use the domain, run it independently, test it really well, and I can treat each of the interfaces as an adapter that bridges from the domain to one technology domain, technology arena or expression. So hexagonal architecture looks kind of like this. Uh, you'll also see it listed as ports and adapters. Uh, but really the, the key notion is each of these adapters is a translation from out here where we're talking in technology concerns to the domain itself. So out here I have concepts like HTTP request, HTTP response, cookie, session, and so on. But by the time it gets translated into here, it's probably some kind of a command object that expresses something happening in the domain. Maybe it's a query object that expresses something you're interested in in the domain. In the domain, I should not see any reference to classes, types, or packages from any of these technologies around the perimeter. That means no inheriting from base classes that come from your persistence framework or anything like that. Pojos, if you're in Java. If you're in Ruby, Poros. Uh, if you're in Python, Popos. You know, this sort of thing. I don't, I don't even know how to say it for C-sharp. Pocos. Pochos? No, but it's a CS, C-sharp. Yeah. Uh, so think about things in terms of this hexagonal architecture. And uh, your domain gets much easier to implement, your services get smaller, and you'll be able to evolve your APIs much more easily because the API translation happens in the adapter layer and your domain doesn't have to keep you know, V1 through Vn of all the domain objects. You keep those out of the uh, adapter layer. So a recurring theme, as I've been talking through this, is sort of keeping your eye on the horizon but taking the next step in front of you. I think it was in uh, The Martian when he said, do the math, work the problem. You know, solve the problem that's in front of you. And once you've solved that, solve the next problem that's in front of you. The next problem may not be the one you think it's going to be. In, in most environments, something like 30% of the services are about managing other services. Those were there to solve a problem. It wasn't the problem they thought they were going to solve, but it was the one they needed to solve. So be evolutionary. Work in context. Solve the problem in front of you, and then work on the next problem. And this is what I've learned about grinding the monolith. Thank you all very much. <laughs> and of course, we are taking questions. And thank you for the great talk. You already applauded to that, but yes, we start in the front row, I still go. All right, um, well, thank you very much for the talk. I'm, um, I'm a little bit confused by some of your um, arguments, or, or I, I did experience them as contradictory uh, to a certain extent. If, you, um, if we kind of go back to an earlier part of the talk where you're talking about the layered architecture and part of the arguments uh, for and against the layered architecture, there. Um, one of your um, gripes, let's say, with, uh, with that part was the uh, argument that you should be able to swap out um, certain layers. Uh, I think we, parts should be interchangeable. And then if we go to the end of the talk, we're talking about the hexagonal architecture, which is exactly about the ability to be able to swap out certain parts. And that you praise, and this you don't. So um, can you well, maybe yeah, go a bit more I'll, into I'll detail? I'll clarify sure. Yeah. Um, so, I, I can see why you perceive a contradiction, and I will claim that there is no contradiction. Because here I'm talking about the definition that uh, Bushman et al. used in uh, POSA, and I'm claiming that this is not how we use layers. We do not, in fact, uh, build layers such that parts should be interchangeable or interfaces would be standardized. So I'm saying that the definition of the layer pattern is not how we actually do things, and those forces don't apply. So maybe we should reconsider 
whether the layer pattern makes any sense at all. Um, in terms of the hexagonal architecture, uh, I don't really view it as being about swapping pieces out, but I do view it as about the domain being independent of those technology concerns and allowing the adapters to provide the translation and forward and backward compatibility that's very hard to achieve inside the domain. So I don't really think there's a contradiction there. Maybe to, to expand on the, on the layers, um, maybe the crucial difference in the thinking was at that time that uh, the, the high level layers depend on the low level layers, that, that would mean that the business uh, layer depends on the persistence layer. And that is that has changed with the hexagonal architecture because the dependency um, uh, direction has, has changed in the other. It's an inversion, it's for an sure, inversion. yes. Um, I'll also say that uh, you know this, this volume is looking at software architecture in quite a general sense. So another of their examples comes from an avionics system. And another example comes from a software-defined radio system. So not all of them are, are business uh, context, and I, I can certainly see in something like a software-defined radio where you've got you know high levels being written by one vendor, low levels being written by another vendor, there may be very standardized interfaces. Actually, oddly enough, they still use Corva for some of that. <coughs> All right, anything that's not about layers. <laughs> All right. Yeah, actually, everything is about layers, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, can you go back to the hexagonal architecture thingy? Almost here. <laughs> Too much animation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so when you're talking about this kind of architecture, that uh, wrapping the monolith with different adapters, talking to different services, is it like uh, uh, let me, let me, microservice? Yeah, let me clarify. Uh, this is what I would do with the services that I'm pulling out of the monolith. So, uh, so this is not the strangler where we're trying to wrap the, the monolith with something new. This is a way of saying, um, when I build my microservices, I still need to have some kind of structure in my microservices. And one of the key problems uh, with microservices is it's easy to get to version 1 and it's really hard to get to version like 5 and 6 and 7. Because the APIs need to remain compatible uh, you know, so you put something out with a new API, but you've got callers who are not operating on the same schedule as you. So you need to support old versions of your API. That's very hard to do if you are taking your, your domain objects and annotating them to map them into uh, JSON or XML, uh, a la the way that Spring likes you to do. Uh, it's relatively easy to do if you say, my domain is independent, I have API objects that are being mapped onto the wire and I can have a V1 and a V2 and a V3 of my API objects, and that's just fine. But the domain is limited to the microservice, uh, or is it shared between microservices? <coughs> uh, I, I think of this kind of as a service. Okay. When you start to build more of them, uh, let's call that the honeycomb architecture. <laughs> Thank you. We have one up here. Oh. <laughs> I like all these concepts, but even from the questions here, um, you've applied this in real projects. Yes. How do you get a moderately sized pool of developers on board with all of this? Because um, they come probably from a crop world, from a, yeah, they, they have ingrained ways of doing things. Yes. How do you transform the development teams? Constant, relentless repetition. <laughs> uh, I, this is actually, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. Well, I'm trying to be a little bit funny. Um, this is a general thing about corporate communication. People hear so many messages coming from so many directions that if they only hear something once and then they don't hear about it in a month, they'll assume it's dead. You have to keep repeating the same things to keep them live. It's like you know a watchdog timer or a DRAM refresh or something. Um, so you keep repeating it, and you keep demonstrating and illustrating. So I'm discussing things at a fairly high level uh, in kind of theoretical concepts because this is a 
group that's had 49 meetups about microservices. So you guys are pretty far down the path. Um, if I were trying to illustrate this inside of a corporate environment working with an existing team of de developers, I would do it in code. I would go to a little trial project and I'd say, look, here's my uh, domain model. I can run it, I can test it, I can poke it, I can REPL it and do all this stuff. Um, and here's an interface object, and look, I get JSON out just like that. I can make a put request just like that. And watch, here's version two. And version two maps into the same domain and everything still works. And they go, ooh, and ah, and you get applause. It feels great. <laughs> um, other ones are harder. So the clone and slash is probably the pattern I have the hardest time getting people to, to even try. Because it sounds so wrong. Enterprise architecture has always been about eliminating duplication, eliminating redundant systems, eliminating <coughs> repeated effort. And I'm going and saying, look, we're going to fork the code all over the place, and it's going to be great, man. Um, so that was pretty hard to get across. Uh, but then you start doing some analysis. So uh, you know, when, when you're doing a meetup talk, you kind of gloss over a lot of the hard details. But uh, in these same systems, I also pull up, you know, structure 101, and I get these huge analyses and dependency structure matrices, and I go, look, we can cluster things this way, and we've got strong coupling here, strong coupling here, not much going between the two subgraphs. Uh, so uh, you use all the arguments you can muster, um, and you keep saying it over and over again. Uh, this, be, this is being a nice transition into psychology, and I think uh, you're very interested in psychology as well and, and systems thinking. And um, I, I think the, the strength of uh, such transformations is in the people who have a systems thinking background. Um, and in, in a way, a kind of progressive or positive pessimism about uh, outcomes uh, that, you know, things will not work, but let's try to make them work. And, and um, you're saying that one third may have succeeded. And um, once you leave, um, maybe there are not enough people who have to share the same systems thinking uh, approach. Or, or Sometimes. you, you, you so. need to kind of leave some people there with the same spark. Um, have you managed to, to yeah. get it? And, and how did you do it? So the, the question of moving on is, is uh, both perceptive and uh, a little painful because uh, sometimes it's really hard to move on. And uh, I have left people behind that I felt like I was abandoning and betraying by leaving them. Um, and then they went on to succeed beyond my wildest dreams. And they showed the patience to work in a corporate environment that was driving me insane. Um, uh, so, uh, there's a, there's a ton of research. I'm, I'm having a little trouble because I want to answer three different things all at once. Uh, so one, there's a ton of research about how do you actually institute change in an organization. Do you sell people on the theory first and get them committed to the vision and then the behavior changes? Turns out most of the time, no. Most of the time, you get them to change the behavior and then our desire to avoid cognitive dissonance kicks in, and we all start to believe in the rationale behind the new behavior. So if you want to introduce unit testing, you start by writing tests. You don't start by selling them on the value of unit testing. This is the reverse of the way most developers approach change, by the way. We tend to approach things as saying, look, I've identified a problem that you don't even know about yet, and here's a solution you've never heard of to solve a problem you don't care about yet. Isn't it great? <laughs> um, uh, so if we start with behaviors and start by doing, that, takes, that gets traction. Um, and the best way to start by doing with most people is to start with examples and work through it and just show them. So I've had uh, entire afternoons where I sit in a conference room with a bunch of people uh, we're all looking at the same screen, and we're talking about problems in the code, and we're refactoring live, and I'm showing them what it looks like to take this you know, gnarly, twisted piece of code with a bunch of uh, intermingled concerns, and by the end, you know, we factored it out into this different object that we've never thought of before, a handful of predicates, and some you know, very easy for loops. Um, so you show them, uh, don't tell. 
The other thing is, uh, uh, in terms of changing processes, you can fight and fight and fight against something that is a negative feedback loop. Like a negative feedback loop is a, a stabilizing process. It's trying to keep something where it is. Like a thermostat is trying to keep the temperature where it is. Um, review processes are about keeping things where they are. It's a negative feedback loop. You can fight those all day long. The best way to win against them is to create a positive feedback loop someplace else. This is why cloud transitions happened on departmental secretaries' uh, uh, expense cards first. Because the positive feedback loop around building things in that way was so strong that internal IT had to come along. They didn't want to, they had to. So um, Adam Jacobs from uh, uh, Chef uh, puts it in, in his way. He says, don't fight stupid, make something more awesome. So build a positive feedback loop around rapid change and evolution. And the stuff that can't change will fall farther and farther behind. And at some point, either the negative feedback loop will just uh, be seen as irrelevant and everyone will stop doing it, or it'll only be done on the one piece of software nobody cares about anymore. And so you can ignore it. So positive feedback loops always beat negative feedback loops. Okay. Long answer. Yeah. Um, is there a um, situation where you just give up? <laughs> 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 and how do I recognize it? Now it's time to give up. You know, I, I hate to sound defeatist, but there are some companies that, you know, you, you cannot make them succeed in spite of their desire to fail. Um, have any of you been approached about uh, an agile transition project lately? <laughs> there are still companies out there looking for consultants to do agile transformations. Like, we want to go agile. And I'm looking at this thinking, holy crap, it's 2018. Like, if you want to go agile, no one from outside is going to be able to help you because there's something inside that's preventing that. Um, but uh, you know, when do you decide it's enough? I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm like 75% Norwegian, and I was raised Lutheran, so I know I was born to suffer. So <laughs> I stick with projects way longer than I ought to. <laughs> Any more questions? We still have time left. Okay. Oh, oh. the third question by you. Yes, here. Just go ahead. Well, technology, technology choices um, have a large impact, I guess, on, on, on the health, uh, mental health of people. And, uh, <laughs> and so, have you come across a current set of technologies that? Um, have helped your sanity uh, in the recent years. Yeah, absolutely. Closure. <laughs> Easy one, really. No, not the joke. No, totally serious. Oh, you want me to sell it? <laughs> no, I've been coding in Closure for seven years, and it's a lot of fun. The feedback is immediate. I'm always living inside of my program. Um, I've got access to all the great libraries in the Java world, um, and uh, yeah, some of the smartest people in the world are working on Clojure, so I get to draw on all of their work as well. Sounds like fun. Okay, so let's wrap it up. Give a big round of applause.